Trump's campaign has been dealt legal defeats in two key swing states over ballot counting. A judge in Michigan dismissed a lawsuit from the campaign requesting officials stop counting ballots while the campaign got, quote, meaningful access to observe the tallying process. Meanwhile, in Georgia, a judge tossed out a suit claiming dozens of unprocessed absentee ballots were mixed in with processed absentee ballots. CBS News projects Biden winning Michigan, but Georgia remains too close to call. For more on this and other legal fights surrounding the election, I am joined by Derek Muller, a professor of law at the University of Iowa College of Law. It's good to see you again, Derek. All right, we're on the other side of the election now, and we're seeing some of those lawsuits that you and I had discussed were likely going to come down the pike. So they're getting tossed out, though, rather quickly after being filed. What's your take on this, and what does it say about the Trump campaign's efforts to stop ballot counting? Right. So stopping ballot counting is really only going to be a temporary measure, saying essentially we need to sort of hold things in place until we remedy questions. Um, and right now, there haven't been really many opportunities briefly for an hour in Pennsylvania, you heard. Um, but right now, it's sort of a two-track approach. One is we need observers, which they've had a little bit of mixed success on. We need uh, observers in Pennsylvania, which they won on. They lost one of those in Michigan. Um, and in some other cases, saying there's some problems about, you know, these batches of ballots shouldn't be counted. One, one dispute about 50 53 ballots in Georgia. And as these disputes have arisen, the question is, what kind of evidence does the campaign have? They file the lawsuit, and then you show up in court and have to show the evidence. And unfortunately for the Trump campaign, right now, the evidence is just not there of any kind of systematic fraud, that the complaints are filed, um, there's an allegation, but there's not enough proof to back it up, and so they're getting thrown out. So they won that that case in, in Pennsylvania on, on getting more observers in the polling places, but in a lot of other places, it looks like the evidence just isn't there to slow things down. Yeah, it's, it's important for people who aren't necessarily as familiar with the law to remind folks um, that that anybody can can file a lawsuit. It doesn't mean that there's that there is any basis to those claims. And in fact, being tossed out rather quickly would indicate that perhaps there wasn't much basis for those claims. Right. Yeah, I mean, so these are things, I think, that are not being filed by just random voters, right? They are sort of with the sanction right. of, the, of the Trump campaign or those who are affiliated with it. But but you're, you're right that, that uh, it doesn't take a whole lot to file a complaint. They're not maybe outright frivolous or lawyers could get disbarred for filing those kinds of claims. It's just enough there to open the door. But yeah, when there is a hearing and there's an exchange and they hear the election official side, the other side of things, they are starting to lose these claims. Well, the Trump campaign says it plans on suing Nevada over allegations that 10,000 people who cast a ballot no longer live in the state. Officials have denied improper ballots are being counted. What exactly does the Trump campaign need to do to prove that there is, in fact, this level of voter fraud that they're alleging? Right. So we haven't seen the complaint filed yet. So we're still kind of guessing what that might look like. But, you know, evidence of residency is a difficult thing sometimes to prove. Um, voters who register in a state, you know, we kind of presume they're still there until they've moved somewhere else. And we have systems in place to cross check if they leave the state that there's, uh, you know, voter systems that, that try to verify if you've gotten a driver's license elsewhere, they'll cancel your registration in a different state. It's not always perfect and it takes a little time. But, but to get to a level of 10,000 voters, right, is going to require some substantial evidence. And even then, the question is, what's the remedy, right? If you think there's 10,000 illegal votes cast in a state, the most drastic remedy is to throw out the election and, and hold a new one. And, and that's a really difficult thing to do. We've done it before in other elections, like gubernatorial elections or, or a congressional election in uh, North Carolina last year that was thrown out on account of fraud, and they held a new election. It's difficult to see how that remedy works in a presidential election, because the presidential electors are supposed to meet December 14th to cast their electoral votes for the next president of the United States. So I think the re it's not just finding the evidence of extensive fraud. It's also thinking about what the remedy looks like, which is a real challenge here. Hmm. Well, the Trump campaign also says it will formally request a recount in Wisconsin, a state that CBS News has projected that Biden will win. Walk us through how this process could work. Yeah, recounts are totally ordinary things that candidates are entitled to. Uh, losing candidates can petition for them. If you remember, we actually recounted Wisconsin in the presidential election four years ago. Green Party candidate Jill Stein requested a recount where Donald Trump won the state by about 22,000 votes. 
Now he's down about 20,000 votes, and he might want to recount. So candidates can petition. They're entitled to do that. Sometimes in some states, it's on a statewide basis. Sometimes you can request particular counties for a recount. Um, and the election officials will get together in those counties, and they'll walk through the ballots and make sure every vote was counted. Um, and for the most part, what we've seen in recounts is recounts can sometimes shift the race by 100 or 200 votes. Um, but shifting it 1,000 or 10,000 votes is really extraordinary. So recounts are ordinary. We should see those play out over the next few weeks. But, but if the margin is, is 20, 30,000 votes in a state, I think it's very difficult for a recount to change the outcome of a state that, that's already had a preliminary count. Derek, I think that when, when people think about uh, these types of recounts and these legal challenges, Minds immediately go back to Bush and Gore in 2000 and that Florida recount. How do the lawsuits that we're seeing now compare to what we saw back in 2000? Right. So it's sort of a different uh, posture uh, in those cases, right? In, in, in 2000, it was really a question of the recount, right? So we aren't even at the recount stage yet. We're still in the count. In 2000, it was the recount. And the Gore campaign said, we, we're looking at these few counties. We want to count these kinds of ballots in a particular way. Um, the ballots were actually not the, the best kind of ballot. If we talk about hanging chads, right? Punch no, cards. No, they were really were terrible. These scrap, <laughs> yes, yes. These little scraps of paper flying all over the room, right? So that made the recount extra challenging. So the litigation really focused on this one state where it was narrowly decided. At the time, Florida was decided by 537 votes before getting to the Supreme Court. So we're thinking about one state being the difference and a very narrow margin of victory. And in that case, it was sort of challenging, like vote by vote, where each of these one ballots, one at a time, was challenged. So at this stage, it's a little bit scattershot of litigation. It's sort of everywhere trying to figure out if there's going to be something that sticks, sort of stemming the tide till the vote is completed. So right now, we're sort of patiently waiting to see if Georgia and Pennsylvania can complete their counts in the near future. I think we'll have a much better idea of where the race stands Friday and what the litigation or recount picture might look like early next week. I think that's a good point, Derek, because back in 2000, it was just one state, a few counties, a really messed up butterfly ballot, um, voters who said that they were confused about who they were casting a vote for. Um, in this case, uh, at least as things stand right now, President Trump's pathway to victory is narrowing. We're not just talking about one state. He'd actually have to win several of these states in order to uh, have an argument for, for his 270. But still, we heard him again say just a little bit ago that that he would go all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, does he have any legal ground to do so, in particular, when we're talking about stopping ballot counting? Uh, or in any other case, how realistic is it that we would see this issue go to the highest course and court? And under what basis, what argument? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's difficult to stop the counting unless you can say this batch of ballots was unlawfully cast, right? That the signatures were mismatched, that someone mishandled the ballots in the chain of custody. Again, so far, those claims haven't gone very far. But it's worth reminding people, you know, there is a case in front of the Supreme Court right now. The Trump campaign intervened in that lawsuit, and that's the lawsuit out of Pennsylvania. And I know earlier in the program, um, you, you had uh, someone, a reporter talking about this dispute out of Pennsylvania, those ballots that arrive in the three days after Election Day, those that are postmarked on Election Day and those that are lacking a postmark. Mark. And the Trump campaign challenged this to say the state Supreme Court essentially rewrote the law. The law in Pennsylvania was very clear. It clearly said ballots have to be received by Election Day. So there's going to be a question about that batch of ballots. But even in that question, right, is Pennsylvania the decisive state, the one swing state that turns the election? Are the number of ballots coming in after Election Day enough to change the outcome of the election? Because the Secretary of State has said it's going to be a few thousand ballots. It's probably not going to be something in the hundredth the house and margin, which means it's a very small pool. And would that small pool change the outcome of the election? So it's still possible to think about the Supreme Court with an issue in front of it right now to change it. But one other thing's happened. We've held the election. And a lot of voters went to the polls on Election Day expecting that their votes were going to be counted if they were mailed by Election Day. And I think that makes it also a much more difficult claim for the Supreme Court in considering the validity of these late arriving ballots. All right. Derek Muller, thank you. Thanks for having me.